Hello, everybody, and welcome. Um, my name is Lonnie Reed, and as a way of introducing myself, I should say that I served in the Connecticut uh, legislature um, as a state representative for 10 years. And I quickly discovered how valuable it is when states can work together um, to address key issues. Um, the Council of State Governments is uh, instrumental in facilitating these kinds of partnerships. And we are grateful for uh, CSG's eagerness to sponsor this webinar, Public Access in Peril. So what is public access in peril? Um, as consumers increasingly flee cable in order to stream instead, uh, stream their shows instead, um, the process is called cord cutting, you've undoubtedly heard it. Um, and, and, but many public educational and governmental program providers, PEG providers, uh, across the Northeast are experiencing significant budget shortfalls with no relief in sight. PEG services um, air local government proceedings, uh, town hall and board of education meetings and hearings, um, and along with uh, all kinds of community events and you know parades and uh, games, you know the kids' games, um, concerns, celebrations, um, and given the demise of local newspapers. PEG is now the only way most citizens can stay in touch. Um, efforts to rescue local PEG programming are happening in several states with approaches that vary. And today we're gonna meet some very impressive advocates from four states who are fighting to protect critical local programming. Um, we're hoping again that we can find a way for us all to work together to kind of find solutions for, for this issue. Um, so we've got, um, as I said, four really uh, incredibly respected leaders in this field. So I'm gonna get to quick introductions uh, and then we're going to get into the program. Uh, the first, and, and uh, there we go. Uh, the first is from Vermont. So uh, Lauren Glenn Davidian, um, she is the di executive director of CCTV, uh, the Center for Media and Democracy. From Massachusetts, we have David Gauthier. Um, he is president of Mass Access, which is also a community media organization that are working to uh, rescue their media. Um, in New Jersey, we have Mike Rispoli. Um, he's the senior director of journalism policy at Free Press, and he ran a grassroots campaign for the state to create the Civic Information Consortium. And um, from Connecticut, we have Walter Mann, who is co-chair of the Connecticut Community Media Association and executive director of North Haven Television and um, Brantford Community Television. Um, let's just, Walter, since we're with you, let's, let's get started with you. And you know, you've been engaged in the struggle for quite a few years now. And so paint a picture for us, you know, how is this funding erosion impacting Connecticut's PEG channels and, and what are we losing? And, and how are we trying to fight that, Walter? Well, yeah, certainly, uh, as, as Lonnie had mentioned, the, the whole issue of cord cutting is, is really affecting um, the community access providers. Uh, prior to my involvement in, in community TV, uh, I did work in commercial radio and television. And I can tell you firsthand uh, that federal deregulation over the years that relaxed FCC rules on the licensed radio and TV broadcasters commitments to public service. So what happened was a void was created for that type of programming. And I think community TV really has, uh, you know, tried to step in and succeeded in stepping in to uh, kind of fill that void. Um, and uh, in, in terms of specific things, you know, whether it's, as Lonnie mentioned, town meetings, we've gone beyond that with doing live local election coverage, uh, local public affairs programming that the broadcasters used to be required to do to use those public airways that they're licensed to use, um, as well as uh, certainly during COVID. Uh, and different types of emergency and public safety programs. A lot of town governments have, have turned to us uh, for help in getting the messes out during COVID in, in various different ways. They were faced with a lot of uh, challenges from the municipal governmental level as to how to best communicate with uh, the public. And we helped them in a lot of ways and they've really turned to us more and more uh, now than, than ever. And I think you know we, we've helped out in that area as well, uh, scholastic sports and much more. 
But we've also, uh, you know, in addition to, to serving cable TV, we've kind of grown with the technology in that we're offering our programming on the internet, on our websites and on platforms like YouTube and Facebook, and Vimeo and others. And all this is only possible because when cable TV started, uh, for those that don't know, uh, cable companies agreed to provisions to fund and create and fund local community TV. And they did that because they had to use the public rights of way where the telephone poles are that carry their cables to provide their service. And so they agreed to do that back in the 70s. And that's really what, you know, created uh, community TV. Unfortunately, uh, technology has passed the laws by and the cable TV companies, of course, are losing the traditional cable subscriber to uh, streamers or cord cutters, as Lonnie has mentioned. And the cable companies themselves have kind of used those antiquated laws, uh, you know, to, to push their case that they only need to fund cable TV subscribers um, as, as far as the, the funding mechanism for our community TV stations. So as more cable subscribers drop off, um, we lose our funding. And that's a continual pattern that we see, and it's just increasing. Uh, what needs to be done is that uh, legislators need to step up and recognize the fact that those very same public rights of ways are used to deliver internet and streaming services. So they should be held accountable just because the technology has changed. They're still using the same infrastructure, the same uh, you know, rights of way to provide their services. And so they should be held accountable and be required to uh, base our funding on subscribers as a whole, not just television, cable television, but also internet uh, subscribers and that would assure that we would have long-term survival right now uh, we don't know it, it, it's not a, a a rosy picture by any shape of the imagination um, you know in connecticut we continue to push hard for changes at the state level uh, we've hired a well-respected lobbyist now for a couple of years it's really worked out well um, we continue to push the state's public utility reg authority, regulatory authority which has jurisdiction over cable television uh, in Connecticut to uh, make changes. And, uh, you know, we're, we're hopeful that as time goes on and we continue to push harder and harder that we can get those, uh, those laws changed. But it's really time for legislators to step up and support this before uh, it's gone. It's, a, it's something that has filled the void, as I mentioned. It's, it's critical to a lot of people. And, you know, I might add too, that one of the uh, things that we found over the years that's really been a, a benefit to the public is getting uh, middle school, high school, and college students involved at this level. Uh, we've had many that have trained here and learned the broadcasting field and gone on to careers at major networks. So there's so many benefits uh, of what we do. And you know we need help from the very people we elect to ensure our survival. Thank you. And I should say, um, those who are watching, as your, as your questions arise, please put them in the Q&A box because we're going to have uh, questions and, and we're really going to you know, dig deeper uh, as we move forward. Um, the next um, person we want to talk to is um, Mike Raspoli from New Jersey, the state of New Jersey. And um, Mike, I'm waiting for Mike to come up. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> Hey. Okay, good. Okay, there you are. All right. Um, so, Mike, you've taken a unique approach to creating a community media consortium in New Jersey. And um, you said it was in base on an incredible um, research that you had done um, the community hunger for information and news that most immediately impacts their lives. Um, so, how's this approach going, Mike? Yeah. Um, well, first, thanks for having me today. It's great to hear from you all and be with you all. Um, so um, so I, I work for an organization called Free Press, which is a national media and technology advocacy organization. And we work on a variety of issues um, that impact local communities and their information needs, things like net neutrality and broadband access, as well as the work that I focused on specifically for the past few years, which is uh, local news policy. And so in New Jersey, like many other states, like many of you have witnessed and we've talked about, local news is disappearing. Um, there are fewer journalists, fewer newspapers, funding for, for community media and peg stations are being cut. And um, the, the real world impact of that 
is that communities, people, individuals, uh, if you're a lawmaker, your constituents have less news and information that allow for them to participate in democracy. Um, we know from studies, from research that in communities where local news is deficient or disappeared altogether, that fewer people vote and fewer people volunteer, fewer people run for public office, fewer federal dollars go to districts that don't have a robust local news presence. And so I think it's really important that as we talk about these issues that we first and foremost center the real impact on communities that the loss of local news is having. And so in New Jersey, we organized around the state and got uh, thousands of people involved uh, to support a bill called the Civic Info Bill, which created the Civic Information Consortium, which is a collaborative effort among the state universities that receive public funding and invest that into news and community information needs. And so specifically targeting communities that um, what are which are called news deserts, which um, we know that news deserts are communities that don't have uh, a local news presence to uh, you know, to sustain people's needs, typically tend to be uh, communities of color, low-income communities, rural communities. We know that communities that um, have been the most impacted by this are, 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 are folks who don't have commercial media necessarily, a newspaper still serving their town. And so, um, so what the consortium does is that invest public dollars into, into those communities in local news projects, in civic technology projects, and strengthening libraries and strengthening community collaboration. And we, we use this approach in New Jersey uh, because we know that communities themselves have different needs and kind of like a blanket statewide policy or, or investment in public media wouldn't necessarily meet what these specific needs are. And so I think by investing public funding into communities, promoting media entrepreneurship, promoting um, more civic dialogue, we're, we're just starting to see the consortium now years later making those grants. And it's really exciting the types of, types of projects they're investing money into. They, some of them look like traditional news outlets and some of them don't. But I think what's really exciting about it is that uh, this is a new model that I think many other communities and states can, can replicate. And um, you know, the, the, the last thing I'll say before I, I pass it back to you, Lonnie, is that I think what is, um, what's the most interesting thing that happened in New Jersey was that this was an initiative that sprung up from grassroots organizing, from, from public uh, campaigning. People from all around the state signed petitions, showed up to events, uh, shared how the loss of local news has impacted them. They testified before committees. They lobbied in the state house. Um, this is an issue that that people do care deeply about. Maybe they don't care about local journalism, but they do care about getting news and information about where they live, so that they can be connected to their neighbor, and so they can know what's happening at the local school board meeting, so they can know what's happening in the state house. And so um, I think that there is a, a lot of support for new types of public funding for local news. In New Jersey, it was a bipartisan effort. Um, it was something that brought in stakeholders from all around the state, different communities, different political affiliations. And so um, I think the one thing that we learned was that, um, you know, states, you know, municipal bodies need to think about new ideas for how uh, public policy can, can best support the needs of their constituents and the people that they represent. Thank you, Mike. That's very intriguing. And again, if people have questions, put them in the question box because we're, we're going to circle back and, and deal with that. Um, our next uh, state is Massachusetts, which actually has, I think, um, the last count, more community media outlets than any other state. So it's a long tradition in Massachusetts. And um, David uh, Gauthier is, um, heads a collaboration of, of uh, these media centers. And um, I know, David, that you've introduced legislation for a couple of years, your organization. And I'm wondering you know, what it says and how it's going and also give us a flavor for the kinds of programs that uh, folks in Massachusetts really care about. David. Sure, Lonnie. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm not sure if we have the most here in Massachusetts, but we do have the most per capita. So, uh -huh. okay. uh, you know, it sort of depends on the population, I guess. So, 
Um, just a few words, uh, and thanks to everybody for, for being part of this great group. I just want to reiterate that this issue that we're talking about is real, uh, and it's something that's upon us at this point. Uh, those of us in community media have been talking about the eventuality of this decreased funding for many, many years. And in fact, in Massachusetts, I've been involved in this organization, Mass Access, for about six and a half years. And we've been talking for several years past about alternative revenue and how do we bring more funding into our operations. What we're realizing, though, unfortunately, is that no amount of production services or program sponsorship is really going to solve the problem that we're facing. And it's also coming a lot more rapidly than we could have predicted. Just before we got on, I did a little bit of uh, number crunching and I looked uh, at cable subscriptions in Massachusetts from 2014 to 2015. The difference in the drop off was less than 1%. Not too bad. The difference between 2017 and 2018 was 3.2%. So you can start to see it's steepening. The difference from 2019 to 2020 was 7%. So it's something that's happening quite rapidly here in Massachusetts. So what we've tried to do is introduce a piece of legislation that would update existing law. Our main contention is that streaming companies are using the same public rights of way that the cable companies are using to sell their products. So companies like Amazon, Netflix, Hulu, they're not paying a dime back to the municipalities or to the states where they're making all their money. So we introduced this legislation back in 2019. And in that legislative session, I don't think the legislation was, was quite ready for it yet. It got sent to study. Uh, so we reworked it and reintroduced it uh, in 2020 and 2021, excuse me. And it is now in uh, both sides of the Massachusetts legislation as House Bill 130 and Senate Bill 2200. Uh, they have slightly different titles, but it's the exact same text. <laughs> and I just wanted to mention too, that it's important to note that this is not a novel idea here in Massachusetts that we came up with. In fact, many states are already collecting assessments on digital goods, including streaming video, mostly in the form of a sales tax. And this is sort of gaining momentum, I think, across the country. In fact, just this morning, I saw that there are a couple of towns in New Jersey who are fixing to sue Hulu and Netflix for a portion of their revenue. So this is an idea that is sort of catching on throughout the country. But in Massachusetts, we're hoping to take a slightly different tack on it. And what we're trying to do is, is share those funds collected. So it's not a money grab for community media. The way we have it structured is that 20% of the assessments collected would stay with the state. 40% would be distributed to the municipalities and the other 40% would be distributed to the community media centers who serve those municipalities. To our knowledge, this is the first legislation of its kind, and we're happy that this model is being investigated in other states as well. To this point, it has about 80 co-sponsors in the House and Senate. We had a very successful legislative briefing in June, and we're hoping to garner more support as we gear toward a couple of hearings in September and October. Uh, we've been doing sort of as much campaigning as we can on social media, telling our stories and, and telling of the success, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic, all the things and all the gaps that community media in Massachusetts filled as we went, th as we went forward. Uh, you know, there, there was so much response from the community media field during the COVID-19 pandemic. And I, I couldn't have been happier with the way that our folks handled themselves and really stepped up to fill in the voids that were, that were being created. Um, parishioners who needed to, uh, to, to attend uh, services when their houses of worship were able to do so thanks to community media who solved issues and, and went ahead and helped out these, uh, these houses of worship to do live streaming. Public schools and students didn't have access to the tools that they needed or the very lessons 
that they were supposed to be getting from public schools. Community media stepped in and sort of helped close that digital divide. And when governments needed uh, a little bit more help to get their meetings either done remotely or in a hybrid sense, community media was, was the actual string that tied these communities together. Uh, we've been working so much with older adults in the community in Massachusetts here to try to stem this, this terrible uh, trend of social isolation and loneliness. Uh, so we've been trying to deliver as much informative and interesting content to older adults. This is just some of the very few things that community media stations in Massachusetts has been doing. And I won't just say Massachusetts because I know it's happening all over the country. Uh, there is a sense out there, I think, at times, Lonnie, that community media is a thing of the past, you know, that, that this isn't important anymore. This was, you know, before we had YouTube and before we all walked around with, uh, with video cameras in our pockets, we needed something like this. Well, you know, uh, Walter said it earlier, and I happen to agree with it wholeheartedly, that, that we have evolved as an industry, as the technology has evolved. We've evolved to become a very important part of local uh, communities and, and, and municipalities and, and all the residents uh, have come to really depend on the services that community media centers are offering. And if you need any proof of that, you can ask the parents of the kids who weren't allowed in the gym to watch them play basketball or volleyball, but were able to flip on a community media station and watch that live stream. Or ask the thousands of students, as Walter mentioned earlier, across the country who get into reputable film and, and television programs because of their relationship through school with a community media station. You know, it, there's so much that we can do and can continue to do, but funding is a big part of it. And if the funding isn't there, we're, we're in a position right now, today, where managers of community media stations across the country are having to make very, very difficult decisions about what they're offering as far as programs and who they're employing too. There are literal, you know, the future is so grim, you're looking at maybe laying people off or, or do you have to regionalize the way print media has done so much? And so much of that hyper-local is lost in that situation. So uh, I just want to, to, to thank you all once again for, for listening and, and understanding that this is a problem of not 10 years from now, it's a problem of today. And uh, we certainly could use any help and support that, that you might be able to offer. So thanks very much. Thank you so much, David. That, uh, that was well said. Um, and we're gonna go now on to uh, Vermont, um, Lauren Glenn Davidian, and you've been involved for many years now make creating a robust community um, media ecosystem in Vermont and um, you're executive director of the Center for Media and Democracy, CC, uh, CCTV Center for Media and Democracy. And I know, and I've been reading some of the reports, um, you've, um, you've done extensive research and um, I know you've pulled together a coalition of community broadcasters and we're looking at various options, you know, really, really exploring what might work. And so I'm wondering if you can tell us about that. Sure, thank you, Lonnie. And I'd just like to um, acknowledge we have, I think three legislators from Vermont who are watching this panel. So welcome, nice to see you. Um, and thank you so much for your support. Um, I just, I think I'd like to address sort of three aspects and then get to your question. The first is just to give a snapshot of what Vermont uh, community media looks like. The second is to talk about the tectonic shift from analog to digital regulation, which is really what we're dealing with. And I think it's legislators um, you are going to be dealing with in spite of whatever limitations the federal government have, has put on states and municipalities to regulate the digital universe. And then the work we've done, the PEG study uh, to lay the groundwork for looking at new ways of funding community-based media and other public benefits. So the first is 
in Vermont, we have 25 community media centers. We have a population of about 600,000 people. These community media centers serve every corner of the state, not only through cable television programming, but also online services, summer camps for kids, on and on the basic community media services. We produce about 18,000 hours of original programming collectively. We share that uh, so that these are aired on the 75 plus channels across the state. We have more than 80 employees that are employed and we utilize about $8 million in uh, subscriber, I think it's really important, cable subscriber revenue. This money comes from cable subscribers, not from the cable companies directly. And um, that is because of 5%. Uh, it's not strictly a franchise fee, but a kind of franchise fee for operations and about a half a percent that is spent on capital investments. We were identified by the Vermont legislature last year as an essential service during COVID because of the role that we play in continuity of communications, anything from the governor's regular press conferences, which we arranged to have streamed and were, have continuously been streamed to hybrid public meetings, municipal meetings, greasing the wheels of democracy so that they can continue and also community functions like graduations and church services, all of this switched to hybrid very quickly. I mean, switched to virtual very quickly. And now um, we're in the process of switching to hybrid coverage in person and virtual simultaneously. And that expertise is um, really important and valuable for our community at this time. It's an indicator, I think, of our community resilience and also, it's a really strong indicator of the kind of state level support that has been given on the regulatory and legislative levels to and local levels to community media. Um, there is, as Mike said, a, an emerging communications deserts for uh, local newspapers are closing and legacy local media funding models are collapsing. And that is affecting the kind of information and knowledge that the people in our communities have access to. I think it's really important to understand that cable franchise fees, which are based on the commercial use, it's a public benefit given in exchange for commercial use of the rights of way, is, is based on an analog regulatory model. And both cable, public educational and government access cable, which depends on the public benefit on the communication side of federal regulation and E911 and universal service, which those services depend on um, a public benefit on the telecommunication side of federal regulation. Both of those are being affected by the decline in use and the cutting not only of the cable cords, but the conventional television cords. And so the public benefit model is based on an analog period of time. And it has not been updated to reflect a digital period of time. An internet service is not considered either a communication service or a telecommunication service. It has been classified as something entirely new called an information service. And in our business, we say it's not a floor wax or a dessert topping, if you remember the Saturday Night Live skit. <laughs> and so the federal government has tied the hands of states and localities on what kind of public benefits can be required from information services. So this is sort of the fundamental challenge that we face is that the revenue from the analog era public benefits is declining rapidly. And we don't, we have not updated telecommunications tax policy on the state level, local level, or on the federal level. And that is leaving it to the states and localities to come up with this hodgepodge of solutions, which is what we're talking about today. So while Massachusetts is looking at a streaming tax um, and sort of identifying this nexus between public rights of way and streaming services, which could be argued, but that's the case Massachusetts is making, the PEG study that um, the legislature, PEG meaning public educational and government access, that the Vermont legislature funded 
and that came out in January, talks about a revision of the entire public benefit structure in the state, a looking at a um, updating of telecommunications taxation policy that affects, as I said, not just cable funding, but E911 services and universal service funds. And the, the one of the key ideas, which is different than streaming a streaming fee tax assessment, however you want to call it, it, it does depend, um, is one of the ideas, but the other kind of core idea, which I think ties right into the right of way use is this idea of um, putting a fee on pole attachments. And the pole attachment fee could offset about maybe up to $4 million in, um, in funding for all of these communication and telecommunication public benefits in Vermont. So it's a, it's not yet reached the, the level of legislative debate. Um, there are a variety of opinions on whether there are the legal legs for pole attachment fees. There are um, a lot of competing pressures because the state of Vermont, like many rural states, is trying to get broadband out to as many communities as possible. And a pole attachment fee is seen as possibly a deterrent to those community-based broadband projects. So that's not a highly loved solution. Um, and then there are the questions of the, the, the federal right of ways, which have their own fee structure that is limited to cost and not to cost plus public benefit. So there's a lot to be discussed here, but I think what's really important for the legislatures in the room to understand is that you are being called upon and are increasingly going to be called upon to, to rethink your telecommunications tax structure and to do it within the limited confines that the federal government has given you to solve this problem. All of that is to say, I think that Mike very well spoke to the community, the community organizing that goes into convincing legislators that this is an important thing to do. You know, what's I think a value in Vermont is that our legislative base has understood that this is an really important because they depend on community media and local newspapers and all of the local media outlets as a way to reach their constituents and, and engage them in the process of democracy. And that in the end is what is at risk if we don't solve this funding problem. And there are a variety of ways to do it. There's ways up out of the general fund, there's streaming taxes, there's right-of-way fees, there's diversified revenue and grants that we as the access centers are working on avidly and actively, but we cannot offset this two to 7% annual decline in cable revenue um, without the help of our legislators. Well, that sounds easy peasy. <laughs> I mean, I think we've gotten a real look at how complicated this all is and how many layers there are and how many generations there are. And you, and, and you just made that point very well, uh, Lauren Glenn, of, of how many gen generations there are of, um, of um, regulations and legislation to, to fund all of these things. Um, we're going to go now into our Q&A period. And I'm wondering if, um, Jack, do you have any questions for us? We, we don't have any questions yet on, on, on the Q&A. Okay. Maybe. Well, we've got our own questions, I think. So we can, we're, Please go um, ahead with we're good with that. <laughs> there, there is one question just to say, Jack, from um, Representative Yantachka, who's from Vermont. And I'm not sure you can see it. So do you want me to read it? Nope, sorry. Yeah, I, I wasn't looking in the chat. I was looking in the Q&A. Sorry about that. Uh, I'll, I'll read it aloud. Oh yeah, there's a lot of chat. Um, in Massachusetts, how does the bill assess the amount of tax on Hulu, IMDb, or other streaming platforms which do not charge for viewing, at least on many older programs? Are the lawsuits you mentioned assessing the ad revenue the platforms are getting? And that's from Representative Yantachka. So the answer to that one is that um, the amount that uh, the companies would be assessed is, is based on the gross annual revenue. 
just like the just like the cable. Uh, so if they're giving away programming for free, they're not really making any money on it. Uh, so uh, I I think that you could still get some of that free programming, you know. But it's it's the, it's important to to note here that what we're trying to do is is put the onus back on the companies, not on the residents. And as far as the lawsuits, I, I can't really speak to them. They're not really in Massachusetts, but I assume it's 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 the same sort of thing. It's gross annual revenue, whether it's coming from ad revenue or from subscriptions, uh, it's probably all lumped in together. Okay. And Joan said it's a flat 5% fee on each streaming service. Uh, and Joan is a sponsoring uh, representative here in Massachusetts and she's wonderful. So I am very glad that she's here. Oh, great. Excellent. Uh, representative Godfrey in Connecticut had his hand up. Uh, I'm gonna allow you to ask a question live. That's all right, uh, Bob, give me one second. Great. Good to, good to have you with us, Bob. How are you, Lonnie? I'm very well. You look very well. Well, thank and, you. And it's just so good to see like people, even if they're talking heads on I know. Uh, computer screen. In little boxes, yeah. <laughs> I know. I'm, I'm, uh, you know. I've been involved in CSG now for over 30 years, and I just miss the camaraderie. I miss yeah. the before and after discussions that go on after these things. Um, one of the, uh, the issues I'm curious about is, is the, um, the cable industry is so uh, diverse in that, you know, we've got 169 towns uh, here in uh, Connecticut, all based on how far an ox cart could move in a day in, uh, you know, 1776. Um, and so we have almost as many um, cable uh, companies because they pretty much are uh, apportioned here by town. Um, I'm in Danbury, Connecticut. We have Comcast, but when you go to the suburban towns, they have other uh, cable TV companies. And, and what that does is it means there's no ability for the cross-border uh, government information and meetings and that kind of thing to, uh, to, to be able to be accessed by people not in the town. Now we've we've had in Connecticut uh, the Connecticut Television Network, which is a, a state government owned and operated uh, television station that's uh, that's uh, both does cable and streaming. Uh, so people do have incredible access to the legislative process and procedure and meetings and public hearings, um, executive branch uh, agency meetings and. Um, uh, press conferences and and even judicial branch um, things like uh, the uh, uh, oral arguments before our Supreme Court are we is, is kind of that unique in in its uh, you know inability <laughs> to kind of grow outside of the uh, the these ancient town lines to be able to in the 21st century to be able to communicate with uh, our not only our constituents but those of people around us it's it's it seems to me to be an obstacle Walter did you want to start with that um you know it, it's all i can say is that it we you know we we've tried for a couple of years to uh or more actually to push back uh, to try to get uh, change at the state level. You know, we, I've and others have testified at day long hearings at the state capitol. And um, unfortunately, we're, we're battling big companies that have, you know, <laughs> millions and billions of dollars that to hire powerful lobbyists. And, you know, it's, uh, it's always that pushback that hurts us. And, and uh, I guess, I don't understand why um, more elected officials um, don't get behind this. I mean, this is, you know, something that also uh, helps them uh, perform their duties in office um, by getting their faces out to their constituents that perhaps otherwise, you know, they wouldn't be as visible. Um, but uh, that, that's, you know, that's one of the big uh, things that we always hit that big roadblock up in Hartford is the, uh, the pushback from the, uh, the big companies. 
I'm wondering if anybody, I mean, I've always, one of my huge, <laughs> why is not, I mean, I, I watched the FCC change direction. And, um, and I know when I, we talk to a lot of our, um, our federal legislators, they're, they're very into saving um, you know, community media, but the FCC, you know, what, when is it going to kind of really revisit it in ways that are helpful to uh, community media? And I'm just wondering if anybody's had any interactions with the FCC that they could share. Well, I, I just, I have just a couple things. One is, I have a question follow up for Walter, which is, are, do you stream your channels? In other words, there may be these regulatory uh, balkanization, but isn't your content available on streaming online in addition to just the channels? Um, we, we do offer um, most of our content uh, on an in and on demand fashion. We don't actually stream the channels themselves, yeah. um, but we do offer, you know, most of the programming online. Uh, and, you know, I would have cable companies say to me, well, why are you giving it away for free? It should be available just to subscribers, um, which, you know, certainly that that's something to think about. But I mean, uh, you know, our feeling has always been that uh, to offer it to more people uh, is, is is better. But uh, yeah, we do offer stuff online. We've, yeah. we've done that. We started that years ago, we, you know. Yeah. Doing that. And that argument is that train has left the station like 2002. Um, about sharing content. A any standard operating nonprofit does that. So there's no reason we should be confined. But to answer Lonnie's question about the FCC, you know, prior to the Biden administration, the FCC was um, headed by a, uh, well, kind of pretty famous Chairman Pai. And um, he basically moved the FCC to rule that channels and um, in-kind services for PEG over and above should be subtracted from this franchise fee, whether it's collected by a municipality or a state. And that went to court and that's currently being litigated. And the current FCC, which doesn't have a chair yet, I think that's coming pretty soon, um, unless I missed it and it happened. The current FCC has a, with a different chair that represents the Democrats is going to have a different point of view on this question and is going to be inclined to be more supportive of PEG. But probably rather than starting a new docket, they're going to try and participate in the court proceedings that have followed the previous FCC's um, action to promote the essentially depletion of public access funding to the advantage of the cable operators. The advantage being that other communications providers don't have a peg fee and the cable operators are seeking a level playing field so that they don't have to provide public benefits. Whereas our approach to the level playing field is that all providers should be providing public benefits. And that's, this is a struggle that I just want to underscore for people that since 1990, when the phone companies got into the video business, we have seen this coming and we have been fighting for the reform of telecommunications and communications policy. So this is going on a long time. And essentially it's going to have to go back to Congress and it's going to go back to Congress and FCC will interpret whatever they rule and then the courts are going to litigate it. And this is the constant circle of public benefit until we die. This will still be going on. So we need legislators to take an active role in creating some prototype legislation that can get moved up to the federal government and adopted because so many states are doing something to address public benefits within the authority that they have. I should say that the acting chair of the FCC now is uh, Jessica Rosenworcel, who yeah. actually is an incredibly brilliant attorney who happened to grow in West Hartford, Connecticut. And uh, she has really stood up for community television and yes. for, for consumers. And so 
you know, I think the more we can kind of feed into whatever that is and, and, and clearly the president and all of that to kind of really understand the transformations that we're all going through and also the sacrificing that communities are gonna make would really be helpful. And, you know, to that, and I'm just wondering, Mike, what you did and how you put together a grassroots um, effort that resulted in people you know, showing up at the state capitol and all of that. I'm just wondering how you did that because <laughs> that feels like we need that as um, you know, part of our arsenal. Yeah, I mean, and I think, I think what's kind of linked to, to the, the really good points that other folks here made is that um, a lot of the reason why local news is disappearing is because of the policies that are in place, the public policies in place that promote media consolidation, that promote national ownership over local entities, policies that, um, that, that underfund really amazing community media and, and, and public media. And so I think what we saw in New Jersey was, um, you know, recognizing that a lot of these policy changes are needed at the federal level, we saw opportunities at the state level where we already kind of had like a pretty active network of people that we were working with. Um, and I think that, you know, I, I, I think that there's a, there's a few reasons why um, the Civic Info Bill passed in New Jersey. Uh, one being, like I mentioned before, like the real kind of energy and interest from the public for state government to take action. Um, if you live in New Jersey or have ever been to New Jersey, most broadcast media comes from out of the state, uh, which means it's always been an overly kind of overly reliant on local newspapers. And with thousands of journalists and dozens of newsrooms, newspaper newsrooms that had closed over like a decade or 15 years or so in the state, people were really feeling it and were kind of demanding action. Um, and I think something that's kind of come up here, whether you're talking about, you know, Comcast or you're talking about uh, Gannett or Alden, who are huge newspaper owners, um, the, 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 the business model of local news is broken and in many ways is in direct conflict with better informing communities. And so I think it requires a real structural solution that does examine how public funding can be injected into, into more communities so that, so that we kind of correct for this market failure. And so I think if we're gonna see, um, if we're not gonna see action at the, at the federal level, I think it is really interesting to look at what states can do, what local municipal governments can do. And we've seen lots of really interesting policies out there that are, that are being presented. Uh, we're obviously talking about different ways um, to, to help fund peg stations. In New Jersey, it was kind of a new public funding model, uh, but we're also seeing you know, states take action around taxing online advertising. I think that states looking to extend online advertising taxes uh, and then using that money to, inf to, to fund or better fund community information needs. Maryland just passed a bill, although the money doesn't go to it, but we're looking at other states that are looking at extending that sales tax to include targeted digital advertising. We're also looking at state, we've also seen states examine uh, creating uh, community information districts. So similar to kind of libraries being able to, to raise money and dedicate that to help support that type of um, information need in a community, could you create something around like public community media um, where a small excise tax is kind of given on anyone in a given area and that money goes towards funding information in that community. Um, so there, there's lots of really kind of interesting proposals out there. Um, and I think that we can, we can make it happen when we kind of move away from the, how the conversation has been set at the national level, which is that, you know, that, that media is, is kind of, is politicized, um, that it's kind of, you know, the fake news conversation or whatever it may be, or, or people who are conservative kind of lambasting media. And I think when you look at it at the local level, it's less politicized because we know that, you know, local journalism is really important, uh, no matter what that community looks like, no matter what political backgrounds or affiliations those people have. And we also know uh, from, from research that less local news 
in a community, the more politically polarized that community is. And so if you're a lawmaker and you're looking to kind of, you know, combat political polarization, if you're looking to combat uh, misinformation, whether that is online or offline, supporting trustworthy quality local news and information is, is important. And again, it's not just, it's not just about saving news. It's, it's not really about that. Really what this is about is ensuring that people have the news and information they need so they can participate in their community. And I, and to, again, sorry to your question, Lonnie, the reason why we were able to do this in New Jersey was because that was how we framed it. We framed it, framed as a crisis in our communities, not being able to civically participate not about saving local news. And, I, and, and that's why I always try to really hit that point when I'm talking to, to people, to journalists, to lawmakers, that this is really a matter of making sure that our, our democracy is healthy. And, and just wondering, you know, structurally, what did that look like? So did you go into local communities and, yeah. and get people together and yes, get them absolutely. all? Okay, because that yeah, feels no, like held, that needs to happen. Yeah, we held forums all around the state um, we held 10 forums over the course of a year talking to people about how the local, how the loss of local news has impacted them, what they want out of local news and information, and getting them to come up with ideas. Like if, the, if you had a million dollars to better inform your community, what would that be? And people came up with all different types of ideas that look nothing like how we even like conceive of like local journalism. I mean, it was really kind of interesting. And I think um, that made the issue more concrete to people and to lawmakers and got people really bought into the idea of, wow, like if the state is investing money into better informing my community, um, maybe I should put forward my ideas. And I'm, I'm really happy to share is that uh, several people who participated in those community forums, once the consortium got off the ground, applied for grants and got them. And so, um, you know, this is... Um, you know, I, I think that the more we involve the public and listen to them and listen to their concerns, uh, we're going to be able to come up with some really creative policy solutions. Bonnie, this, sorry, this is Jack. We've probably got time for about two okay. more questions. Uh, okay. We have one in the chat from uh, Representative Blumel. Uh, she said, what are the biggest barriers to moving forward? Uh, moving forward, some of the changes slash initiatives you have mentioned. Another question in the chat, uh, if you didn't see it. Some biggest barriers to moving forward. Lauren Glenn, if you want to start off, if she's one of your legislators. You know, we were speaking, thank you. Nice to hear your voice. I was speaking with another legislator uh, earlier this week and she, what she said was, there's not enough understanding of the urgency of this question. And that's interesting because it's so urgent to us. It's just big and loud in our ears. And that doesn't mean it's shared by everyone else. So I think um, being able to translate this issue in a way that is um, people find alignment is number one, which of course can be done. And I think Mike has got a great example of how it was done yeah. in New Jersey. And then I think um, overcoming the, the federal hand tying, you know, the federal preemption of state authority is gonna require some creativity. And I think it's gonna require a short-term solution and a longer-term solution, at least in Vermont. So um, that would be, I think others would have some other to add. Walter, yeah. Yeah, I just wanna add quickly, I know time's running short, but I, I really think we, you know, what Michael said was a great example. and. You know, I, I don't have a lot of faith I, I, in the FCC, I, you know, whether it was the Bush, Clinton, Obama or Trump administration, all I've seen throughout the years uh, is deregulation that has affected uh, localism negatively. And I hope that maybe Jessica Rosenworcel will will be different and that, you know, that that's going to be a good thing. But uh, I, I'm not too optimistic just based upon the past performance of the FCC. And I really think we need to, you know, push it from a state level. And of course, as, as Lauren Glenn mentioned, the key thing is to find ways to effectuate change uh, without, you know, being blocked by the federal preemption of state regulation of uh, broadband and internet. Well, I have to, I think that pretty much wraps it up, but I have to say I'm leaving here feeling optimistic that we're talking and hopefully, hopefully we can expand the space to include other states and other input 
and you know, and come up with some sort of a collaborative regional model to, because I think we're absolutely right. Um, I chair something called the Connecticut Green Bank, and we're dealing with a lot of energy issues, and um, and we're only getting, um, you know, real traction when we regionalize. When we're really going in with Massachusetts and Pennsylvania and Maryland, and you know, that's what gets your attention. So um, I'm really grateful to. Um, to CSG for facilitating um, this program and please everybody um, check back with um, CSG. We've got links, we've got a ways to stay in touch uh, so that we can you know, create an action plan going forward. So I thank everybody, I thank all of our panelists, incredible input, you've done a lot of work. I thank CSG and uh, you know, wishing everybody uh, some good local news. <laughs> Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Lonnie. Thank you, Lonnie. Thank you.